The next session is Workshop 8, Systemic Chemotherapy and Oncology 4. The chairs are Dr. Ji Donjia, Dr. Atsushi Hiraoka, Dr. Taro Takami, and Dr. Kazuomi Ueshima. Doctors, please. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. So I uh, would like to start Workshop 8. Uh, the first paper is uh, Dr. Ji, uh, take a chair. Dr. Dr. Ji, please. Okay, dear chairs, thank you. It's very nice to co-chair this session with you. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not be to go to be there in person, but I hope this is also make it. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Yano. His uh, the topic is survival improvement in advanced SEC with systemic therapy over the past ten years. Uh, this is a very interesting would be very interesting topic. Uh, Dr. Yano, please. Thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity. I'm from Do uh, I'm Do Yano from FA University. The title is Survival Improvement in Advanced Hepatocellular Carcinoma with Systemic Therapy over the Past Decade. We have nothing to declare for this study about disclosure of conflict of interest. Background. The, the increased utilization of systemic therapy, system therapy options has provided patients with a better chance of survival among various types of malignancies. In recent years, options for systemic therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma, HCC, have increased. Described as below, there are many options to treat HCC from sorafenib to dilumabumab. However, the effect of sequential treatment on the prognosis remains unclear. Therefore, the goal of this study was to clarify trends in treatment for HCC between 2008 and 2022, and to investigate the impact of sequential treatment on patient outcome. This was a retrospective analysis of data collected from two hospitals between May 2009 and December 2022. The Ethics Committee of Ehima University Hospital approved the study protocol, which conformed to the guideline of the 1975 Declaration of Helsinki. Patients were separated into the following three groups. According to the date of the first systemic therapy, Period 1, between 2009 and 2013. Period 2, between 2014 and 2018. Period 3, between 2019 and 2022. Baseline characteristics before treatment and the and number of therapy line were compared by period, using steel DWAS test and Fisher's exact test. Time to progression, TTP, and overall survival OS were compared by period using log rank test. TTP was defined as a time between the date of the beginning of the first systemic treatment and the date of progressive disease onset. OS was defined as a time between the date of the beginning of the first systemic treatment and the date of death or last follow up. This is patient flow chart. The enrolled patient was 349. In detail, period one, 86 patient, period two, 139 patient, period three, 124 patient. This was baseline characteristics by period. The three groups were similar in terms of age, sex, performance status, modified RB grade, BCLC stage. However, there was a significant, significant trend in etiology between three groups. The percentage of viral hepatitis related HCC was found to decline over time. In line with etiology, 
a significant difference in body mass index was, was also observed. Finally, a higher proportion of three or more, more chemotherapy lines was also observed, uh, also observed over time. This figure shows Kaplan-Meier curves for TTP by period. TTP in period three was significantly higher than those in the other two period. This figure shows overall survivors by period. Ah, this figure shows Kaplan-Meier curve for OS by period. OS was improving in order of period and period OS in period three has a higher than the others. We additionally analyzed the overall survival among BCLCB and C subgroups. In BCLCB patient, OS showed a gradual improvement over time and period three has a higher the, than the others. In BCLCC patient, period three has the highest OS. However, the difference was not significant. We think that the reason is the observation time was short. In fact, 48% of period three patient, uh, BCLCC patient in period three were undergoing treatment at the time of reporting this study. Therefore, further investigation of overall survival in period three is needed. We additionally analyzed the predictor of mortality. In univariate analysis, factors associated with shorter overall survival were modified RB grade, BCLC grade, intrahepatic tumor number, microvascular invasion, FP value, the number of systemic therapy line, and therapeutic efficacy at first line. In multivariate analysis, factors associated with shorter overall survival were modified RB grade, intrahepatic tumor number, microvascular invasion, extrahepatic metastasis, FP value, the number of systemic therapy lines, and therapeutic efficacy at first line. This is about change of treatment content. In period one, all patients received strafenib at first line therapy. This, the sequential treatment used were TS1 and UFT due to the absence of second line options. In period two, patients receiving rendemachinib at first line therapy appeared. And the number of patients receiving therapy sequential treatment and the variety of administered agents increased. In period three, almost half of the patients were treated with adesolimbaz and bevacizumab at first line therapy. Observed in these trends, the number of and the variety of systemic therapy lines have increased. In summary, overall survival improved significantly over the period. The patient receiving multiline chemotherapy increased over the period. The associative factors for good OS were liver function factor, tumor factor, treatment factor. In particular, it is impressive that the increasing number of therapy lines have led to a better prognosis. In conclusion, increased treatment options have improved prognosis for advanced HCC patients receiving sequential therapy. Thank you for attention. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Yano, for your congratulations for your excellent study. 
a uh, very clear presentation. But here I have a, a question. You, uh, Cox regression analysis, both univariate um, uh, and uh, multivariate analysis, didn't showing the survival associated with the, the time period. Is that true? You show the survival correlated with the uh, uh, oncology burden, like stage, number, and other factors. But I didn't see it is associated with the different period. I hope you got my question. Is that true? Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, Alex. Could you please? Uh... Okay. Okay. Yeah, you are, you want to say that the more recent period patients has a better prognosis, overall survival. For example, the like the year. 2019 to 2022, the survival is better than the previous years. The, the, what, I think you, what you want to say that, but uh, the, the uh, multivariate Cox regression analysis seems didn't uh, show the time period is associated with the, the survival. Uh, uh. I think Jidon, uh, the question is not yeah. clear. Omata, better okay. clarify. What's the questions? Jidon Jiao. The the question is mm. uh the, the it seems the Cox regression multivariate analysis right. does not show time period has association what, what do you mean with the survival. Period? I mean the, the 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 late the three three time period, you mean three the three three stages, three time, in the early time, the middle time, and the late. I mean, the uh, uh, from two thousand nine to two thousand uh, two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen, two thousand eighteen, uh, and two that yeah, two time stage, uh, two time period. Uh, three. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. It seems like he catch it, so he may respond. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, we we divided the patient uh, into three times, uh, three periods. Uh, um, because uh, um, because uh, uh, starting time was uh, 20, two, uh, 2008, uh, so uh, we divided uh, 2008, uh, the time from 2008 to 2022 uh, into three groups. So, sorry. Okay, I see. I, I see your point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Amata, for your uh, kind help. Thank you. If there's no other, uh, if there are any other comments from the audience or questions or other co-chairs, any, any comments or questions? If no, I would like to uh, to give the, the, the chair to the to my co chairs. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yano. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chair. And next presenter is uh, Dr. Chin Shen Su from Taiwan. Uh, the title is Association Between Presarcopenia and Clinical Outcomes in Patients with Advanced HCC undergoing systemic therapy, a comprehensive study and meta-analysis. Please, please, Dr. Su. Can you hear me? Please turn, turn on your microphone. Please, Dr. Su. Okay. Dear chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Xu from Taiwan. Today, I will present our study entitled with Association Between Presarcopenia and the Clinical Outcomes in Patients with Advanced HCC Undergoing Systemic Therapy, a comprehensive study and a meta-analysis 
we have nothing to declare for this study. Before this talk, I have to introduce the trend of presarcopenia to you. According to the statement of EWSOP, the European Working Group on Sarcopenia in Older People, there are three components, including in the definition of sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass and the impairment of muscle strength and performance. Based on these three components, EWGSOP proposes three conceptual stages for sarcopenia. The pre-sarcopenia stage, the sarcopenia stage, and the severe sarcopenia stage. For patients with only loss of muscle mass were called pre-sarcopenia. Although many studies have shown that sarcopenia is associated with poor outcomes of patients with chronic liver disease, including liver sources and HCC. However, most studies only examine the loss of muscle mass. Very few studies examine the impairment of muscle function and muscle strength. Moreover, with the emergence of new systemic therapies, understanding the effect of sarcopenia on patients with advanced HCC receiving systemic therapy is critical important. Therefore, in this study, we aim to examine the prevalence of presarcopenia on HCC patients and also the effect of presarcopenia on HCC patients receiving systemic therapy. This slide shows the search strategy of our study. We used a free text search with appropriate mesh term and or M3 terms related to presarcopenia and liver cancer. We identified published articles from the PubMed and the m based database up to 2023, April 5. Finally, we identified 411 articles from the PubMed database and 814 articles from m based database. This slide shows the PRISMA diagram of our study selection. After excluded duplicated records, we also exclude the papers not related to the main topic and also exclude the papers not original articles. We also exclude the paper that uh, examine the liver tumor but not HCC. At the end, we included 20 studies into our meta-analysis that contains 2,377 HCC patients receiving systemic therapy. Let's see our results. This slide shows the prevalence of presarcopenia in HCC patients receiving systemic therapy. In this first plot, you can find the column, event rate column, that shows the prevalence of HCC patients. And the poor prevalence of presarcopenia in HCC patients is 43.4, with the lowest value is around 15%, and the highest value is 65.1%. We also examined the effect of presarcopenia on HCC patients receiving systemic therapy. In this slide, you can see the first plot that shows the effect of presarcopenia on the overall survival of patients receiving systemic therapy. The hazard ratio, the poor hazard ratio is 1.7. That indicates that patients with sarcopenia will have a shorter overall survival than those without. We also examined the effect of presarcopenia on progression-free survival of HCC patients receiving systemic therapy. On this five plot, 
you can find the hazard ratio column. The pooled hazard ratio is 1.32. It indicates that patients with presarcopenia will have a shorter progression-free survival than those without. We also conducted a subgroup analysis. In this slide, uh, we showed the progression-free survival as an example. We examined the subgroup including the treatment arrangement, different study region, different study quality, and the different observation time. And you can find the hazard ratio are similar among different subgroups. In summary, in this systematic review, we identified 20 studies with 2,377 HCC patients, all receiving systemic therapy and had available CT imagery for the measurement of muscle mass. The pooled prevalence of presarcopenia was 43.4%, and the patients with presarcopenia had a shorter overall survival and a progression-free survival than those without. The hazard ratio of overall survival is 1.7, and the hazard ratio for progression-free survival is 1.32. We also conducted subgroup analysis according to the types of systemic therapy and find the result of subgroup analysis, including sorofenib, levotinib immunotherapy, are similar to the result of overall patients. In conclusion, our studies showed that presarcopenia is prevalent among HCC patients undergoing systemic therapy and is associated with poor outcomes, <coughs> including overall survival and the progression free survival over the patient. Therefore, our results support us to give early intervention or prevention strategies such as nutrition support or exercise to improve muscle mass of this patient population. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation. And uh, any question and comments from the audience? Uh, Dr. Hirok. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, so I'm uh, Atsushi Hiroka from Ehime uh, Prefecture Central Hospital. Uh, many HCC patients uh, develop in chronic liver disease. Uh, as you know, chronic liver disease patients uh, often suffer from secondary sarcopenia. So some patients already have uh, presarcopenia at introducing a system treatment. Uh, is there uh, effective supportive care adding on system treatment in presarcopenia patients to improve therapeutic effects. Uh, do you have any suggestion? Uh, our study only shows the association, but we not not exam the, the sarcopenia is during the therapy or before our therapy. But I think. Um, Maybe because the sarcopenia is a parameter of nutrition of the patient, so uh, it is important to correct the sarcopenia and the presarcopenia about the patient. Even we did not know uh, the sarcopenia is exists before the treatment or not. Is that the answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question in the comments? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Su. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the ne next uh, speaker. So, Dr. Phil Su San from Korea. So, from which? Uh, ah, okay, in person. So, constant uh, efficacy of hepatic artery infusion chemotherapy, it has irrespective of uh, PDL1 positivity uh, uh, in uh, unresectable hepatocellular carcinomas. Uh, Dr. Sam, please. Thank you for the introduction. And today my topic is uh, about the efficacy of HIC uh, 
depending on PDL1 positivity in unresectable HCC. HCC can be classified into three categories according to their immunogenicity. The first here picture describes the immunogenic uh, HCC, and in this case, CD3 positive T cells and CD68 positive tumor associated macrophages are infiltrated, and these macrophages may express PDL1 as well as tumor cells. And in these cases, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy can, can have a greatest efficacy and the tumor can be shrinked. But in these cases, only uh, tumor associated macrophages are infiltrated, but PDL1 is negative. And these three immune desert type, uh, immunogenic therapy cannot have efficacy. So these three categories can be classified in, for ACC. And in, you can see that in nivolumab responder, PDL1 expression can, is uh, relatively high in this case. And, but in here, nivolumab non-responder, tumor associated macrophages are infiltrated, but there is no PDL1, so the patient cannot respond to nivolumab. So ACC can be classified into th these three categories, and these three categories can be an, a marker for immunogenic therapy, especially for this PDL1 expression. And PDL1 can be stained by various clones of antibodies, for example, 23, 22 C3, which is a prototype of uh, PDL1 staining in lung cancer, and also SP263 can also be used for staining for PDL1, and SP142 also can be used. And our group uses 22C3 uh, antibody for PDL1 staining. And in this report, uh, published in last year in Nature Medicine, the authors used uh, SP263 clone of PDL1 staining, and they reported that when the PDL1 uh, combined positivity score is more than 10, the responses to atezobeb can be dramatically favorable to sorafenib. So PDL1 can be a uh, marker for uh, the responses to atezobeb treatment. In our group this year reported that PDL1 staining can be a marker for the response for lenvatinib treatment. Everyone here may know that lenvatinib can also modulate Im immunogenicity and immune responses of ACC. And when PDL1 expression is high, the progression free survival for lenvatinib treatment can be significantly better then patients with low PDL1 expression. So immunogenic tumor can respond better to lenvatinib. And let me introduce HIC. HIC is very commonly used in Japan and also in Korea, but in Korea, our institute is the, uh, uses HIC most frequently for, for advanced HCC treatment. And we use the protocol for high dose FP regimen. So we use high levels of cisplatin and 5-FU. And 5-FU is infused three days. And in this study, we wanted to identify the role of PDL1 expression in HIC responsiveness. This was a retrospective study and patients with uh, diagnosed with ACC treated with HIC with available biopsy samples between January 2020 and May 2023. And we will assess those kinds of things. And the patients was uh, enrolled a total of 40 patients. And we divided the patient into PCL1 positivity. Uh, the first group was PDL1 positive cells, combined positivity score uh, over 1%. And the second is no staining of PDL1. And there were 30 patients for PDL1 positivity more than 1%. 
and there were 10 patients without PD-L1 positivity. And these are the patient baseline characteristics. And in Korea, there are many of ACC patients uh, are infected with chronic hepatitis B virus, and the responsive rate was PD, according to the PDL1 positivity. There were no significant difference between PDL1 positive patients and PDL1 negative patients in uh, uh, HIC treatment. So the responsive rate was about 20%. And the survival plot demonstrates that the over survival and progression for survival, also there are no significant difference according to the PDL1 positivity. You can see that uh, no significant uh, difference between PDL1 positive HCC and negative HCC. So here we, we, can, uh, we can conclude that PDL1 positivity is not very important in HIC treatment. So this is exemplary immunohistochemical chemical staining findings. Uh, these patients were high PDL1, and these specimen shows low PDL1, meaning no PDL1 expression. So even high PDL1 expression, the patient showed progressive disease in HIC, and even no low PDL1 expression, the patient responded to HIC. So PDL1, which maybe have very critical impact on lenvatinib or atezolizumab treatment, but HIC PDL1 is not very important, is our uh, opinion. So overall, in this report, we confirmed consistent efficacy of HIC irrespective of PDL1 positivity. So this may suggest that HIC may be an option to atezolizumab progressors with known period, no PDL1 expression. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Any questions from audience? So you, you don't have any uh, data of, uh, result of a high treatment after atezolizumab treatment? Yeah, we have the data and uh, yeah, yeah. In, yeah, yeah. In your abstract, you show there are around 50% of effect of, uh, after high treatment. You, you, you abstract, yeah. including. I have the data, but and we are now uh, in submission <coughs> to the uh, medical journal about PDL and atezolizumab, mm -hmm. and uh, when patients with high PDL and expression. Uh, meaning that CP combined positivity score over two in, in, in those cases, the patient responded to atezolizumab treatment, but in, when PDL1 expression was low, mm -hmm. the uh, response to atezolizumab was very, very bad. So we have the data, and I didn't bring it today, and the data is now being under review in on medical journal, and yeah. Okay. So yeah, we want we want to see the uh, result uh, uh, high treatment after uh, at the failure. Okay, I, very, I, also the data, yeah, I, I also have the data. Yeah, I also have the data, and the response yeah. rate for hike was forty percent uh -huh. after atezolizumab failure. Uh -huh. So it was very impressive for us, okay. and now we are also submitting yeah, the more, data. More, to more, more, we want to know the after the uh, high treatment. Uh, uh, failure of, of uh, steroid regimen. Uh, so that you 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 show that the lemochinib uh, treatment uh, may enhance the immuno right, right, right. response. Right, so right. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's very interesting. I right, think. right. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, yes, very, very interesting study. Uh, in your PD, PDL1 staining. What, uh, what's, what, what's the cell type of the PDL1 positive cell? It can be uh, uh, carcinoma cells or uh, macrophages. Most of the cells are macrophages. Uh, and it, it, you show the different pattern of staining between the PDL1 high and the responder and the PDL1 high and non responder. In the non responder, there is a very regional staining, which is something like. Um, the PBMCs or macrophages. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, 
I can and, understand. Yeah, and that may be uh, related to the cell type you propose that uh, immune high and, uh, and the second one, time rich. <laughs> There, there, there should be some association with the TAM rich cell types of yeah. MCC and the PD1 positivity. TAM, in TAM rich uh, phenotype, there are two kinds. First is TAM, when TAM expresses PDL1, it responds to immunotherapy. But when TAMs do not express PDL1, it does not respond to immunotherapy. So TAM rich phenotype of HCC can also be subclassified into two different phenotypes, okay? Mm -hmm. Any, any question? Okay. Uh, is there any changes uh, of PDA1 status pre and post uh, HSC uh, treatment? Okay, that's a very, very important question, but we, we do not perform uh, biopsy after, after. <laughs> HIC, so we, it, we do not know, but it, it will be a very interesting story. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Imro. Uh, his title is uh, Genetic Discrimination Between MC and IM Could Be Useful in Planning Tumor Specific Treatment Strategies for Recurrent HCC. Please start. Thank you, Chairman. Um, today, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the usefulness of gen uh, genetic analysis in the treatment of recurrent HCC. <clears throat> we have uh, no COI to disclose. Uh, Hepa cell carcinoma has a clinical future, multiplicity, and frequent recurrence after initial treatment. So, as you well know, HCC recurrence consists of multicentric occurrence, MC, and the intrahepatic metastasis, IM each possessing different biological features. So therefore, uh, accurate discrimination between MC recurrence and IM recurrence possibly has a significant impact on treatment strategy and may influence the prognosis. In the present study, we genetically compare the primary and uh, uh, metachronously recurrent nodules to differentiate between MC recurrence and IM recurrence. <clears throat> then the prognosis after liver rejection was prospectively tracked, aiming to explore tumor specific recurrent treatment strategies. So uh, we created the in house HCC panel covering us. Uh, 72 significantly mutated genes associated with HCC. And uh, we performed uh, genet uh, genetic analysis using NGS. Cancer tissue and non-cancer tissue were collected uh, employing laser microdissection method. So far, uh, 350 HCC nodules from 200 patients were, have been analyzed in our institute. So this is a slide of the show, uh, showing 72 significant mutated genes in our in-house panel. <clears throat> in the present study, among 200 patients, 30 patients who underwent rejection for recurrence were enrolled. And uh, genetic discrimin discrimination between MC recurrence and IM recurrence was performed. Among 30 patients genetically analyzed, 13 patients had the IM recurrence uh, sharing common genetic mutation between the nodules. On the other hand, 17 patients uh, experienced the MC recurrence possessing no common genetic mutation in each nodule. A summary of genetic differentiation is shown in this slide. As, as primary tumors, uh, 18 patients had uh, solitary tumors, and 12 patients had uh, synchronous March 4 HCC. Out of uh, 12 March 4 HCC, eight patients had uh, MC primary tumors, and four had IM primary tumors simultaneously. As a result, 
MC recurrence was 17, and IM recurrence was 13. So then we prospectively followed up uh, on the prognosis of these patients. As for recurrence-free survival, uh, there was no uh, significant difference uh, between MC recurrence and IM recurrence. However, a tendency uh, for slightly later recurrence in MC group was observed. Uh, in the OS analysis, uh, significantly better OS was detected in the MC recurrence patient compared to the IM recurrence group. So, what is the cause of this large discrepancy between recurrence free survival and OS? Thus, uh, we looked at the recurrence free survival after second liver rejection in this patient. Recurrence free survival after second rejection for recurrence was significantly better in the MC recurrent patient. This result uh, possibly account for the better OS in the MC group. So, uh, in addition, uh, we followed up the uh, tumor status in each patient. <coughs> this slide shows uh, tumor status in IM recurrent patient. So, except for um, two patients who had a relatively long tumor-free status, many patients experienced free recurrence within one year, and five out of uh, 13 patients have already died. Uh, exceptionally, one patient had uh, MCD re recurrence after long tumor free status. On the other hand, uh, most of the MC recurrent patients experienced relatively long tumor free status after second rejection, except for four cases. Only one case uh, had uh, died because of liver failure due to drug-associated side effect. So, in summary, uh, in the case of MC recurrence, aggressive therapy, therapy such as the rejection allows the patient to maintain a relatively long-term tumor-free state. On the other hand, patients with IM recurrence showed a strong tendency to relapse after rejection and their prognosis was relatively poor. Uh, it suggests the need for the early introduction of drug therapy. Uh, as you know, uh, INBRAVE 050 study uh, showed that uh, adjuvant atezolbeva combination therapy uh, significantly improved recurrence-free survival after curative treatment in high-risk HCC patients. Similarly, um, this kind of adjuvant drug therapy possibly improve recurrence-free survival and OS in the IM recurrent patient in our study after re-rejection. So, in conclusion, aggressive therapeutic interventions, including rejection, can be expected to improve the prognosis of the MC recurrent patients. On the other hand, Patient with IM recurrent HCC showed a strong tendency to relapse after rejection, suggesting the need for strict follow-up and the early introduction of drug therapy. Uh, so, repeating local treatment without considering tumor-specific factors may pose problem. Uh, finally, we believe that the gen genomic analysis is useful in planning tumor-specific treatment strategy for recurrent HCC. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, now the floor is open for discussion. Any question? Okay. Uh, this results and uh, uh, conclusions are thought to be uh, satisfactory based on uh, genetical comparison results. Uh, so, in the clinical course, uh, can you provide an uh, alternative method to this thing? Uh, so, uh, MC or uh, IM? Uh, clinical use. Yes, clinical. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this study uh, is about uh, re recurrence. So, uh, as a surgeon, I, I'm a surgeon, so as a surgeon, maybe uh, if the liver function is reserved, we perform re-dissection mm -hmm. in, in most of cases. But uh, 
after that, uh, if the uh, recurrent tumor reveals that uh, high recurrence, we, be, we will be very careful about the follow-up. And if uh, uh, insurance allow, we want to perform adjuvant therapy in uh, such a patient, in such patients. Uh, so many, many institutions uh, uh, many cannot uh, approach the uh, genetical uh, comparisons. Hmm. So uh, we want to uh, get some alternative uh, I method. I see. Uh, one of our uh, co-authors, uh, Professor Obi, uh, have analyzed uh, several factors comparing the genetic result, and uh, it includes uh, tumor marker uh, and uh, pathological and an analysis of first uh, tumors and uh, uh, image uh, uh, pattern of uh, CT or MRI image. But uh, uh, we, we didn't uh, found any correlation between the genetic result and other factors. So uh, maybe in the near future, genetic analysis is, will be very common even in Japan, I think. So we should consider the, uh, such kind of strategy in the future, I think. Thank you. Uh, ah. Dr. Nosoka, please. Nosoka City Hospital. Uh, there are many risk factors for survival and uh, recurrence-free survival. And have it, uh, is the recurrent pattern is the independent uh, factor for survival? Or have you checked with multivariate analysis or something like that? Uh, uh, as, men uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, Professor Obi, uh, one of the co uh, analyzed uh, uh, such a kind of uh, study, and uh, but uh, any uh, independent factor other than genetic dis discrimination was found in uh, recurrence factors. So it's independent risk factors yes. for survival. Thank you. Omata, uh, Obi Sensei is not here, so I may respond. In answer to the question of Dr. Hiroka, they, we try to correlate the clinical pathological ways to distinguish IM and MC because there is a certain way of judgment. But uh, two, two doctors decide whether it's IM or MC by clinical pathological features and then open up the genetic analysis, then try to correlate those. Totally confused, no, no correlation at all, basically. So for a long time we used uh, clinical uh, application of this IMMC standard, but uh, it's just a mixture of everything. But the genetic analysis is so clear. In other words, we are not just studying the liver, but we are studying a lot of cases of pulmonaries. And the pulmonaries almost always drive a mutation the same. So that's quite unique for the hepatocellular carcinoma. So maybe that can be used for the future sake. In fact, CGP analysis is becoming so wide widely spread in the maybe next uh, March, oh no, no, sorry, maybe next year, coming June, we might broaden the application of the CGP. So at least one time you can get, especially advanced ones, the genetic profilings, including the messenger RNA analysis. So maybe this can be tested in other institutes. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope to have uh, such a uh, powerful method in our uh, usual clinical practice. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank, thank you so much. much. Uh, I'd like to move on to the uh, next presentation. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Ito. Uh, his presentation title is uh, abdo uh, sorry, uh, Abdominal Pain Accompanied uh, by elevated serum inflammatory markers and viral enzymes for diagnosis, immunocheckpoint inhibitor-induced uh, sclerosing character uh, pharyngitis. Please start. Thank you for your kind introduction, Dr. Hiraoka. I'm Takano Rito from Nagoya University. 
I'd like to talk about my research, which entailed abdominal pain accompanied by elevated serum inflammatory markers and by biliary enzyme for diagnosing ICI-induced sclerosing cholangitis. Let me start my presentation. So ICI are currently used to treat various mal malignancies. On the other hand, IRAE have become a big problem in clinical setting. So that as you can see the right figure, uh, each IRA is known to have a different frequency and prognosis after occurrence of IRAEs. This is a study of non-small cell lung cancer by the presence or absence of grade three or higher IRA liver injury. Both PFS and the OS were significantly worse in the group with IRA liver injury. From this result, we believe it's important to predict the development of severe IRA liver injury earlier. So the main mechanism of IRA liver injury is the hepatocyte uh, injury and the endocellularitis uh, induced by the CD8 positivity and the inflammatory Cooper cells. So uh, we, but uh, we, we reported the PSL through response by the liver injury can um, differ the especially non-hep injury type, cholestastic and the mixed type. This, the, this, this, uh, this type has the IRAE cholangitis. So the, uh, the unique type of IRA liver injury is the immune-related sclerosing cholangitis, so-called the IRSC, which is known to be the steroid resistance its characteristics the following intra or extra hepatic bile duct dilation without obstruction, diffuse hypertrophy of the extra hepatic bile duct wall, a dominant increase of the biliary enzyme such as the ALP and the gamma GTP, uh, detective to the ST and the ALT. Normal or reduced uh, levels of the serum immunological markers such as ANA, AMA, SMA, and IgG4. The pathological findings of biliary tract CD8 positive T cell infiltration finally the moderate to poor response to steroid treatment. So backgrounds and aim, IRSC is relatively rare and its clinical characteristics are not well known. In this study, we aim to summarize the clinical features of IRSC. So method clinical data were collected retrospectively from 1,393 patients with ICI treatment. We analyzed 67 patients, 4.8% with IRAE liver injury over grade three by CTCAE version five and compared IRSC and non-IRSC group. Of the 69 patients with IRA liver injury grade three, uh, eight patients, uh, about 20% about IRSC. So lung cancer was the main, main uh, type of, I'm sorry, uh, type of cancer. And uh, uh, seven patients had the treatment uh, with uh, anti-PD-1 or PDL one Only one patient, the combination therapy. Importantly, the almost all patients, seven patients had the abdominal pain. So the type of the liver injury is only one patient hep hepatocellular injury pattern. However, seven patients, the uh, mixed or cholestastic pattern. So the four uh, treatment, um, ex except for one patient, uh, seven patients, Seven patients were treated with prednisolone and MMF was two patients. UDCA added in six patients. So um, 50 patients 50 patient of IRSC improved. However, four patients not improved. So we, we compared the best, baseline characteristics in IRA liver grade three IRSC versus no IRSC group. Almost all, almost all uh, the uh, AS, such as the AST and the LP gamma GTP. So uh, only AST is the in IRSC groups uh, significantly lower. However, there are no 
significant differences between two groups. These slides show the laboratory features on the onset of IRA liver at the time of diagnosis of IRA liver injury. ST and LT were not different between two groups. However, LP and gamma GTP were signif significantly higher in the IRC group. CRP and NLR were also significantly higher in the IRSC group. So next slide shows the liver injury by R ratio. In the non-IRSC group, hepatocellular injury pattern, uh, hep hepatocellular injury type was about 50%. Whereas IRSC group showed a no hep, hep type indicated elevated biliary enzyme enzyme than the transaminase in IRSC group. For regarding the duration from the initial ICI treatment to onset of CBIRAE, so there was no dif differences um, between two groups in the time from first ICI administration, but the number of treatment cycle was higher in the IRSC group. So for the March, March system, so March pool IRAE, only one patient showed a March system IRAE in IRSC group, um, pancreatitis and the arthritis. However, the, there, there were no differences, significant differences. So presence, uh, for presence of symptom, the, about 50% of the no IR, IRSC group had the presence of the symptom. However, the importantly, IRC group, all patients had the presence of the, some kind of the uh, symptom, especially abdominal pain or back pain. So finally, I'd like to show the representative case of IRSC, uh, 62 years old male head and uh, neck cancer treated with anti-PD-1 antibody, two cycles. After two cycles, the he had the uh, abdominal pain and back pain with the liver injury cholestastic pattern like this. And dynamic CT and the ERC show the um, biliary tract uh, dilation and wall sickness. And the pathological findings show the CDC, CD3 and CD8 uh, T cell infiltration in both liver and bile duct. So we diagnosed this patient as IRSC so, treated, so administ administered prednisone and UDCA. However, um, during steroid tapering, um, the liver, liver uh, enzyme, enzyme flare up. So we add the MMF and uh, increase the UDCA and the liver function is the decreased. So summary and conclusions, approximately 10% of all, all IRA liver injury grade three over, over grade three are IRSC. And uh, as pathogenesis of IRA liver injury becomes better known, the likelihood of encountering IRSC in clinical practice is ex expected to increase. We found that IRSC is characterized by the non hep type of liver injury with abdominal pain and high inflammatory response and its refractory to PSL treatment. Further examination by imaging is recommended to detect IRSC in cases with these characteristics. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, now the floor is open for discussion. Uh, any questions? Ah. Please. My name is Dr. Ju Arai from IH Medical University. Thank you for your beautiful data on clinical experiences related to IRSC and non IRSC. So I'm really curious because IRSC is, you know, really the steroid resistance and sometimes lethal. So, in general, as you pointed out on your figure, so most of the cases are enlarged intrahepatic bile duct and both the, the extrahepatic bile duct. So is that common all the bile duct are inflammated or uh, regional inflammation in your pathological findings? So I guess that distal part of the extrahepatic bile duct looks like more inflammatory. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, very good, very, very important question. So for the a previous study showed the intrahepatic, only intrahepatic bile duct dilation, P 
PSL treatment is effective. However, they're both uh, extrahepatic and intrahepatic. PSL is refractory, uh, is reported. Yeah, and also so far, there are no uh, predicted biomarker to predict the ILSC. So I guess some kind of the PDL1 expression on the surface of bile duct, or do you have any comments or speculations about that? Oh, thank you. However, I have no, no detailed information. However, uh, CTL4, CTL4 is not risk factor for IRSC. So all cases are reported to be the uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 antibody, so, but the biomarker is not. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Thank you for uh, your so nice presentation. And uh, I have a, one question. Uh, usually, uh, sclerosing cholangitis mm -hmm. is not so painful but uh, why uh, the, is the uh, uh, related SC is so painful? Oh, yes, uh, the, their symptom is very, uh, very important for detecting IRSC, I yeah. think. So the classical DD has no symptom such as the abdominal pain. Yes. So the uh, maybe mechanism is not unclear, is unclear but the Bile duct, um, bile duct dilation induced the uh, abdominal pain, so the pressure of the bile duct, high, oh. high pressure of the bile duct, I think. Is the inflammation is yes. so severe? Yes. Oh. Okay. okay. Uh, other questions? So, um, for me, uh, I have one question. Uh, how likely is this adverse event to occur in uh, ICI treatment for HCC? Oh. Thank you, thank you for your good, good question. But the, uh, I have not seen the HCC cases with IRSC, so I believe that mechanism is different. Uh, so the IRA liver in HCC is mainly uh, hep hepatocellular injury type, such as STLT increase. So uh, IRSC cannot occur uh, in HCC patient. No. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, other questions? No? So I'd like to close this session. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, I'd like to close this session by thanking all the presenters for their contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, chairs and lecturers.